So I've been waiting a, a while to give this sermon. It's I've really been ruminating upon it. It had, it had to, I guess I just had to let it take root in my soul what exactly, what exactly this message was because it, it was a very strange thing that happened to me uh, about a year and a half ago uh, that, that some of you know about. I know Val knows about because it, it, it happened right before I was meeting up with him. Does anybody know what this is right here? This is kind of hard to tell, but any guesses? It's in the Old Testament, I'll tell you that. No clues. As, as this is Joshua, Joshua up on the right here in the center. And uh, this, this sermon is from Joshua 9. This, this has to do with the Gibeonites. And we'll, we'll go over this. It's called False Treaties. <laughs> yeah. The Deceit of the Gibeonites. I'm going to read this. Joshua 9. Now, when news of the Israelites' obliteration of the city of Ai reached all the kings west of the Jordan, those in the hill country, the foothills, and all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. But the people of Gibeon, having heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, acted deceptively and set out as envoys, carrying on their donkeys worn-out sacks and old wineskins cracked and mended. They put worn, patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing on their bodies, and the, their whole supply of bread was dry and moldy. They went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and all the men of Israel, We have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell near us. How can we make a treaty with you? And then they said, We are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, Who are you and where have you come from? Your servants have come from a very distant land, they replied, because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the reports about him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites beyond the Jordan, Sion king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. So the elders and inhabitants of our land told us, take provisions for your journey. Go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants, please make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But take a look, now it is dry and moldy. These wineskins were new when we filled them, but look, they are cracked. And these clothes and sandals are worn out from our very long journey. Then the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not seek the counsel of the Lord. And Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. Three days after they had made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites learned that they were neighbors living among them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day arrived at their cities, Gibeon, Shepherah, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and the whole congregation grumbled against the elders. What does this mean? How, how is this? It's amazing. All the Old Testament, we say, oh, that's a nice story. Oh, that's cool. Interesting plot. Oh, that's fun. I like the imagery. But of course, all these things are directly applicable to, to our lives today. In Christ, in the New Testament, sometimes it just takes years and years for us to figure out how. I want to talk about this a little bit before we go more into that. A strange envoy. So an envoy is a diplomatic agent, any accredited messenger or representative, a person delegated to represent one government in its dealings with another. An envoy alights. So there's a strange story that happened to me. It was about a year and a half ago. 
And I was meeting up with Val to go to lunch, as we often do. And I was standing at the, the entrance of this restaurant. It's called Nong's Cow Man Guy. Some of you have probably been there. It's a Thai restaurant in southeast Portland. And I was sitting there, or I was standing there at, at the, the entrance of this restaurant just inside, you know, just through the doors. And a man came up to me, a, a character, let's say. This character came up to me. And uh, he, he, was, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was sort of giggling nervously a little bit. As he was looking at me strangely and giggling nervous, nervously. He came in. He didn't go to the bathroom. He didn't go get a menu. He didn't go into the restaurant. He came in to me, and he, sa he said, this is what he said. He said, you have, you have an amazing aura. Your aura, I can see your power. And I said, oh, gosh, one of these guys. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, what on earth? And uh, <laughs> I said, well, thanks. And, and that's nice of you. And he, he said, you could destroy everybody in this room. Everybody in this room. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> he said, no, no, it'd be, it'd be easy. And in one fell swoop, you could destroy everyone in here. I said, all right, thanks. You know? He said, no, I, no, I see it. I see your strength. And um, he said, it would take me four or five turns to get off any damage on you. You know, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, okay, is this guy high? What's going on? No, he wasn't. He wasn't high at all. He was, he was, he was very eloquent. Uh, he was dressed relatively well. I was wondering if this maybe was some homeless guy on the street who hadn't slept in three days or something. No, and he looked, he looked very presentable. He had a, a messenger's bag and um, spoke great English. And I just couldn't, what, what on earth was going on here? But he said, it would take me four or five turns to get off any damage on you. And I'm thinking, and I said to him, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about like a turn-based video game? Are you, are, you, are you talking about a video game here? Because if, for those of you who know, there are such things as turn-based video games where you have a certain number of turns, everybody gets a turn, and, and you, you fight each other anyway. Uh, Pokemon? No. Okay. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so I said, is this, is this some analogy to a video game you're talking about here? He said, no, this is not a video game. He said, this is not a video game. I, I'm thinking to myself, what on earth is this guy going on about? And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Val, Val did show up, but not before this guy left. And uh, he's, what he said then, he said, just promise me this. Promise me that you will not attack me when the time comes. That's what he said to me. And, and at the time, I wasn't thinking. I mean, I was completely clueless. I was thinking, this guy's a weirdo. He's nice enough. He's complimenting the heck out of me for some reason. Doesn't know me from Adam, or does he? And, um, and, and so he you know, made me shake his hand. I was like, all right, sure, yeah. You know, I won't attack you when the time comes, buddy. You know, go, go back to your New Age festival or whatever. I just, didn't, I just wasn't thinking. I don't, I don't know what was going on. But uh, that's what happened. He didn't go into the restaurant, didn't eat, didn't get a menu, didn't go to the bathroom. He just left. He was just happy, and he left. And I just thought, what? What, ah, what was that? And, of course, Val came. And, and by, you know, 15 minutes later, 10 minutes later, by the time Val came, I was starting to process, wait a second. You know, and, and, and we were able to talk about it a little bit. Um, we'll go into it in a second. But I want to tell you that story. Kind of set up the rest of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never know what happens when Val and I get, get together for lunch. Repercussions. Okay, so these are men, obviously, who have been hung. And this is from a little later on in the Bible. You find out who these men are. So this treaty that Joshua, this false treaty that, that Joshua made with the Gibeonites, really ended up being a thorn in the Israelite side later on. So in 2 Samuel, it's about 250 years after Joshua's conquest, this is what happens. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. 
The Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. So basically what happened is, is Saul had come in as the first king of Israel, and he, out of zeal, or, or so they said, he wanted to put the Gibeonites to death. So he started killing these people that Joshua had made this, this treaty with, who could not be killed. They had to be spared because they had promised by the Lord that they would be spared. So because of this sin, Joshua trying to get rid of these guys, who indeed were a thorn in their side, living amongst them, it was this sin. And what happened? Um, there, was, there was a famine because of it. <clears throat> the king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. And this is, uh, this is David, the king. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul and his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance, that being Israel? The Gibeonites answered him, we have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. So what do you want me to do for you, David asked. And they answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us, so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed, and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gebeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. But the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, that's a different Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aya's daughter, Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter, Merab, whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. He handed them over to the Gibeonites who killed them and exposed their bodies on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together. They were put to death during the first days of the harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. So it's interesting, because of this one mistake where, where the Israelites did not consult the Lord, there was this terrible famine, and seven sons of Saul had to be hung in order to uh, appease the Gibeonites and, and essentially end this this famine that the Lord had brought about because of these sins. This is a really interesting um, illustration, I think, of... So this is Satan kind of as this snake man, and this is Eve in the garden tempting here with the, uh, the fruit. Kind of creepy, isn't it? Wow. Love it. So these are the, these are the false treaties here. Look, he's got scales on the back of his neck, and he's kind of got that... The lizard neck thing. Whoa. I'm an art fan. Okay. Unbelief. Let's talk about this first. Hebrews 11.6, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he, he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So, basically, this, this character who showed up at the restaurant, I believe it was a demonic presence. And for me, he represented unbelief. This was, it was a false treaty that I was making in that po point in my life with unbelief. Because there was a decision, it was a pretty important decision that I made at the time, or I was making at the time that I told somebody I was going to pray about and really consider over the course of some weeks. I didn't, I didn't do it. I really didn't do it. I didn't follow up on that word. I, uh, I just went by emotions. I kind of went by my gut. And, uh, you know, the emotions are they're of the flesh. So I, was, I went by the flesh rather than really consulting the Lord and praying about it like I said I was going to. And because of this, this uh, acting that I, that I was doing really in unbelief, because it was not done in faith, things started falling apart in my life for, for a number of months. It's crazy. My car was broken into twice. Um, I got so sick, I lost 20 pounds, was in the hospital for 
multiple nights. Um, there, I had a relationship, a close relationship with somebody, and it, it just completely fell apart. And uh, and I, it was right. It was all after that happened. Basically, yeah, it was crazy. And I didn't realize at the time, but it was it was a, a false treaty with unbelief. And um, it's just amazing how easy, easily we can fall into these false treaties in our lives with all sorts of things. <clears throat> From James 1, 6, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. We've got to go forward in faith, being sure of what we're doing. Second Corinthians, outside influences. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? We also have to watch our influences, because if we're constantly hanging out with people who are, are not in faith, then they're celebrating unbelief in one way or another. That's what, that's what they're operating in. We have to be really careful with that. We don't want those influences to come in. Just like the Gibeonites, there were this there were this influence of unbelief in Israel. Romans 4.20, no distrust made him waver. This is Jesus. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now, because I, in those few months I was, I was operating, I didn't follow through in that prayer that I said I was going to do. and I, I wasn't operating in faith, but rather just on emotion. There were all those dire consequences, but thankfully because of the blood of Christ, that's, you know, that false treaty is gone. We have, to, we have to be thankful every day. Man, I'm constantly washing my mind by the blood of Jesus because, you know, the, Joshua, he didn't have the blood of Jesus. He didn't have it. When they, when they said something, man, you, that was tough because you had to stick to it. There was no blood of Christ back then. They had to, <laughs> they just had to deal with it. But thankfully, these things do not affect our entire lives. Another false treaty is deception, man. Okay, here we go. Genesis 3-4. Satan, as we just saw, was the originator of this false treaty. The Bible starts out with a false treaty. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Yeah, right. Thanks for that one. Okay. <laughs> Two-faced tendencies. I think deception's been one of those treaties that, that, um, that I've noticed. It's, man, it's, this is a hard one to get rid of. Because deception can be such a, it seems like a small thing, and it just gets in your soul. You say, well, I'm not going to, I don't need to be completely straightforward about that or this. And pretty soon, man, that multiplies. I got to tell you, um, for those of us who came from a religious background with a lot of rules and regulations, what happens is you begin to feel like you can't do anything unless you kind of, yeah, go around and, and, and just make sure that nobody's looking while, while you're doing it. That was my experience. I was just, there were so many rules. I, I didn't, I felt like I had to be, it wasn't like I was some, you, you see what I'm saying? You, you, just, you have to kind of twist things just a little bit. <laughs> and and the problem with that is that it, it just continues to grow. And and I, I know one thing that Val's always talking about is being in the light. And Michael too. Being in the light. You gotta be in the light, be in the light, be in the light. What do you really have to hide? What do you have to hide if you are in Christ? You, there's nothing you nothing you have to worry about. It's a false treaty to make with deception. It's a false treaty. Let's keep going here a little bit. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, this is, this is the flesh heart, you know, or the, uh, the worldly heart. Proverbs 10, 9, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Luke 6, 31, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. I love this. This is so straightforward from Jesus because this has to do with deception too. If we don't want others to deceive us, then we shouldn't deceive others. 
We should be in the light, in the light, in the light. Jesus was the opposite of deception. He was so straightforward. I love it. He had the guts to to not have any deception. Wow. The deception antidote, I think the deception antidote is proclaiming our identity in Christ on a regular basis. Pro- proclaiming our identity as sons. And if we're constantly doing this, we, why would we desire any deception? What do we have to hide? You know, we can be open with each other. We can be vulnerable, whatever you want to say, if that's, if that's the word you want to use. We're in Christ. There's nothing to worry about. We can go forward totally confidently. It doesn't matter. He's, he's got us covered. Another false treaty is worldliness. Second Timothy, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to blame. please the one who enlisted him. I'm going to read this again. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That's us. Okay, this is a really common false treaty for the religious-minded. If, if you, once again, if you were raised in religion, a lot of rules and regulations, this is a very easy false treaty to make because worldliness is an escape. It's a total escape from all this, all these rules, basically. It's terrible. I mean, that, these rules become like your, your prison shackles. And suddenly, a little bit of worldliness, and, you know, it's, it's, it's this type of freedom that you think is freedom that's not really freedom. And it also, for sons, though, it, it can sometimes, we can fall into this uh, because we, we have so much freedom in Christ, and then you begin to translate that into this worldly freedom, which is, which is really, it's bondage, exactly. Thank you, yeah. From 1 John, For all that is in the world, the desires of, of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is from Ephesians, so it's talking about unbelievers. Unbelievers are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned in Christ. From Jude, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. One more false treaty I want to talk about here, and it's fear. From John, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So, Fear is something that we're seeing a lot of right now in, in the world. And I, I loved Grimm's sermon on, on Friday reminding us that we're not to get angry at people because they're operating in fear right now. That's, that's, it was such a good reminder of me cause, for me because I have to say sometimes I'm just thinking, you can't be wearing two masks right now. Come on, man. But uh, it's, not, it's not for us. It's not for us. But there's so much fear in the world. There's so much fear in the world. And we, we just got to remain in the blood of Christ, constantly washing our minds, because the fear is just a lie. It's a total lie. You often see the gutsiest people who ever lived, and that they, had, they just got through everything. They got through everything just because they had guts. And, you know, we're sons of the living God, and we got guts. Just like Jesus did, he had guts. There's no fear. Hebrews, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. I'm going to read this again because this is so interesting. I want you to think about what Jesus did. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, that means humans, he himself, or sons, he himself likewise partook of the same things, 
So Jesus partook of flesh and blood that through death, he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That's why Jesus came in the flesh, to partake of the flesh, and to partake of death, to destroy the power of death, so that we don't have a lifelong slavery to fear anymore. We're no longer slaves to fear. That's a false treaty. And I tell you what, the world's going to try to get you to make that treaty right now. Man, they're going to try to make, get you to make that treaty. Even, even, unfortunately, you know, some parts of the body are trying to make that treaty. They're not meeting. They're, they're following the regulations of the world instead of uh, going forward in Christ. And this is not, we're not here to condemn, but we're here to just be aware that, you know, in the next, in the next few years, next year, or you're going to find where people's allegiances lie, whether it's the fear of man or the fear uh, of God. And, and our allegiance is obviously to the Lord. This is from my, my barber. He's, uh, he's a believer. I, I love this guy. He says, the only person who can, who can cause you stress is yourself, so fear. The only person who can cause you stress is yourself. And the primary stressors which bring upon a lot of fear are time and, and paucity. So the, the aspect of time, running out of time, and then paucity is lack, so lack of anything. But, you know, when you're in the Lord, you're not running out of time. You're eternal. You're eternal. I can tell you what, that's completely changed my life. I, I'm eternal. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about time. Or at least I'm th thinking about it a lot less than I used to. That was such a huge, especially for a historical mind like mine. Um, and then paucity, you have no lack in Christ. These are the two things that, that cause people so much fear. Man. From Lao Tzu, I love Lao Tzu. His philosophies are really cool. There is no greater illusion than fear. Whoever can see through all fear will always be safe. Whoa. From Deuteronomy. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Thank you, Lord. We are going to go forward in 2021 being strong and courageous and daring. <laughs> a little recap for you guys. So once again, this is, uh, this is another illustration of, this is a medieval illustration of um, Joshua and the Gibeonites. It might even be earlier than medieval. Look at these guys. Oh, we're from a far land, faraway land. <laughs> Opportunities for false treaties abound in our lives. Little of this, little of that. Oh, sure, that's fine. Well, okay. All right. And initially, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but, man, it's the snowball effect. I know how it goes because I experienced it last year, and it was bad. We got to say no to these treaties. So, you know, look at these guys, these help us beggars. That's it. Once again, these demonic forces are going to come in. They're going to try to say, oh, just, just poor me, you know. It would take me four, four turns to get off any damage on you. That's Pokemon talk. What do you, what do you, what do you say when, when these, uh, when these <clears throat> treaties come about? You say, get out of here. What do you say to these beggars? You say, get out of here. Go. Be gone with thee. No, fear, you have no place in me. I'm not making a treaty with you. Unbelief, I'm not making a false treaty with you. I'm not doing it. Once again, what to do? Tell them to scram. And the other thing is, you know, when you're presented with a big decision you have to make, do pray about it. Really take some time. Take some time to pray about it. I'm, t I'm saying sometimes a week, two weeks, something like that. Take some time. Consult the spirit of counsel. Because that, I mean, that's, that the spirit of counsel is there for us at all times. To ask these questions. And, and you're going to get the answer over the course of a period of time. It might not be immediately, but just keep praying and, and you'll know. But don't just go on, you know, only with emotions. The Lord gave us instincts, but as we know, we can't always just follow emotions. That's a lot of times of the flesh. Test every spirit, and this is from 1 John, 
Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. I should have done that. It's okay. This, this message had to happen. <laughs> and and, and the, the other thing is, once again, we've got to be constantly renewing our minds with the blood of Christ. That's how we can see clearly is with the blood of Christ. And then we can see when these humble beggars try to come upon us, and we can see them for what they are, which are, which are con men. And we can see that these false treaties are not meant to be signed. Praise the Lord.